So, for today's movie review, I'll be reviewing the 1973 Godzilla movie, Godzilla vs. Megalon. And this movie is perhaps one of the more infamous installments of the Godzilla franchise, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but first, the movie's overall production history. Because around this time period, Tokusatsu television was becoming all the rage, since a lot of TV shows from the likes of Ultraman, Kamen Rider, Kikaider, and Super Sentai were on the rise and became more popular than Godzilla in some cases. So, Toho decided to cash in on this tokusatsu superhero craze by holding a contest which allowed elementary school children to submit a tokusatsu superhero of their own, and the winner of the contest would have the chance to see their original superhero be featured in their own solo movie, which would result in the creation of the robot superhero known as Jet Jaguar, since Jet Jaguar was originally a robot superhero that was called Red Alone that was described as being a cross between Ultraman and Super Robot Mazinger Z from the 1970s anime of the same name. However, it came time for the producers of Toho to reveal the robot costume design for Red Alone to the child who submitted the Red Alone character. The child in question was very upset at the overall costume design because he stated that the robot design he saw before him looked nothing like the superhero he submitted for the contest. As production continued, Toho decided to rename the robot superhero from Red Alone to Jet Jaguar and had their special effects director make several modifications to the suit itself. Now, in terms of what the story would have been about, the movie itself would have been called Jet Jaguar vs. Underground Monster Megalon. And if the name Megalon sounds familiar, originally Megalon was supposed to be one of three space monsters that was supposed to appear in the second draft of Godzilla vs. Gigan that was originally called Godzilla vs. the Space Monsters Earth Defense Directive, but was nixed due to budgetary reasons and was reworked as the main villain for this movie. However, Toho figured that Jet Jaguar would not be able to carry his own solo movie and decided to shut down the project temporarily and rewrote the script to include both Godzilla and Gigan from the previous Godzilla movie in order to add more marquee value, leading to the eventual creation that would become the movie that we're about to talk about today. And since the movie's release, Godzilla vs. Megalon has become yet another infamous installment of the Godzilla franchise. Just not infamous in the same vein as something like the 1971 Godzilla movie, Godzilla vs. Hedorah. Now, what do I mean by this? Do you know how the Godzilla franchise has this reputation of being these stupid low-budget movies that are aimed at little kids? This was the movie that created that reputation for the simple reason that out of all the Godzilla movies within the franchise, Godzilla vs. Megalon on top of having a theatrical release in the United States during the mid-1970s, the movie itself just exploded in popularity on cable television where it would remain from the 1970s through the mid-2000s. And this was one of two Godzilla movies that was featured on the popular riffing show Mystery Science Theater 3000. And despite the movie being one of the more recognizable installments of the Godzilla franchise for for ironic reasons, Godzilla vs. Megalon, along with the return of Godzilla and Godzilla vs. Biolatte, have become the most elusive Godzilla films to obtain on home video. Because everything past the year 2000, almost all the Godzilla movies were available on home video from the likes of DVD and Blu-ray, with the exception of the three movies that I just mentioned. And perhaps this movie even more so, because the only way you could obtain a physical copy of this movie was by either getting VHS tapes and taping the movie off TV, or buying a DVD bootleg. It wasn't until a few years ago where Media Blasters decided to release Godzilla vs. Megalon under their Tokyo Shock division that has since then become more easier to obtain. But enough about that. Does Godzilla vs. Megalon deserve the reputation of being the one Godzilla movie to give the Godzilla franchise a bad reputation? As for the plot in the movie, it's about this trio of inventors who are in the midst of building a humanoid robot known as Jet Jaguar. And one day, they decide to take a break from building the robot to relax at a nearby lake. 
Meanwhile, the undersea kingdom of Cetopia, that's been heavily affected by nuclear testing conducted by the surface nations of the world, begin to retaliate by unleashing their beetle-like god, Megalon, to destroy the surface world out of vengeance. To make matters even worse, a few agents from Cetopia want to take control of the humanoid robot Jet Jaguar in order for Megalon to destroy various cities around the world. However, the trio that ended up creating Jet Jaguar in the first place soon take back control of their humanoid robot and command Jet Jaguar to go to Monster Island in order to get help from an unexpected ally in the form of Godzilla. In terms of what I liked about the movie, Godzilla vs. Megalon's story isn't quite an alien invasion plotline because around this time period, the whole idea of alien invasion movies were basically really popular with the Godzilla franchise. And by the time you got around to something like Godzilla vs. Gigan, that plot thread got really old. However, with this movie, it's not that at all. Because on one hand, you could almost say that this movie is basically a pseudo-remake of Godzilla vs. Gigan, but done in a different direction. Because the quote-unquote antagonists in this movie are not aliens. They're actually humans that just so happen to live underground in the undersea kingdom of Cetopia, which I find to be refreshing. And on top of that, I actually really like the introduction of the concept of the undersea kingdom of Cetopia. Because we're seen anything like that before in the franchise. Now sure, we've been introduced to advanced civilizations before with the likes of the Exilians from Godzilla vs. Monster Zero or the Keelax from destroy all monsters. But unlike those civilizations, the Cetopians are not aliens. They're subterranean humans. And I think that makes them so much more interesting. Since we now have a movie in which mankind is dealing with a threat, not from outer space, but from Earth itself. Although my one gripe with the Cetopian civilization is the fact that I wish we explored more of it. Because as it is, the Cetopians are not as fleshed out as the Exilians, but the Cetopians are definitely more interesting than the Keel lacks from the Stryl monsters. I also love the contrast between the Cetopians and Megalon, because when you look at the Cetopians as a whole, they're very dignified. Yet, when you look at Megalon, he's a goofball, which I find to be really hilarious, where you have this advanced civilization that's predominantly serious, and yet they worship this monster that's very childlike, which I find to be really funny. Imagine you're watching Lord of the Rings, and instead of having the Fellowship of the Ring battling Sauron and his evil forces, imagine Imagine if Sauron's forces were led by Gollum and you get the same idea. Another aspect of the Cetopians I liked is the religious aspect. Because between the original 54 Godzilla movie up until Godzilla vs. Gaian, the only other religious group of people we've seen within the Godzilla franchise so far are the natives of Infant Island who worship Mothra. And much like the natives of Infant Island, the Cetopians also have a god of their own in the form of the giant bug monster known as Megalon. However, unlike Mothra who was seen as being the good guy of her movie, Megalon is the bad guy of his movie. Thus, it gives the Godzilla franchise its first religious monster that turns out to be evil within the Godzilla franchise. And speaking of Megalon, I also really like Megalon in terms of his overall design aesthetics because within the context of the Godzilla franchise, Megalon is not the first insect-themed giant monster to appear within the Godzilla franchise. That distinction goes to the likes of Mothra and Kamakuras. And despite Megalon being yet another giant insect-themed monster, here's where he differs from the likes of Mothra and Kamakuras. Because with someone like Mothra and Kamakuras, they're just giant-sized versions of a moth and a praying mantis. And they're both depicted using using puppets. Megalon, on the other hand, is depicted as a man in suit creation, and unlike Mothra and Kamkuras, who are based on actual insects, the filmmakers took a different approach with his design, because they essentially took a rhinoceros beetle, but instead of making Megalon a giant-sized rhinoceros beetle, they essentially took the general outline of a rhinoceros beetle, made him more bipedal, gave him a short tail, and gave him arms that have drill bits for hands. And I find his overall visual stick to be very refreshing in terms of how insect-themed monsters are depicted within the Godzilla franchise.
guys. Another aspect to this movie that I liked is the movie's overall pacing in the way it tells its story. Because with the previous movie, Godzilla vs. Gagan, I found the combination of the pacing and the story to be kind of boring in the way it's told, where the human aspect of the story is essentially like a mystery. But the problem is, you already know the mystery before it even begins, and the monster action doesn't really kick off until halfway through the movie. With this movie, on the other hand, it doesn't screw around. It just kicks off immediately with... A group of characters chillaxing by a beach, only for the lake to crack open, transforming it into a canyon. Said group of characters go home, get attacked by some Zetopians, and then a few moments later, Megalon gets unleashed. And this occurs within the first 10 minutes of the movie. And once Megalon shows up, the movie kicks it into high gear and doesn't stop. Also, unlike Godzilla vs. Gigan, where a lot of the human stuff was in the first half of the movie and a lot of the monster stuff was in the second half of that movie, with this movie, there's a nice balance to it where you have both the human action and the monster action throughout the entire movie. As for the soundtrack, it's pretty standard, but it's handled well enough. Although I do like some of the newer music that's revolved around Godzilla when he first enters the battlefield, because the music that plays in the background sounds like a banjo. I find that to be hysterical. But at the same time, given the cartoony nature of the movie, it works. Which makes some musical cues in this movie strange, but maybe not as strange as the music you heard in something like Godzilla vs. Hedorah. But strange enough that the music is identified with this movie. As for the next few aspects of the movie that I'm about to talk about in some shape or form revolve around the giant monsters. The first aspect revolve around the introduction of multiple new monsters that take the form of Megalon and Jet Jaguar. Since this is the first Godzilla movie in some time to introduce multiple new monsters. Since the likes of Son of Godzilla and Destroy All Monsters. But here's where all three movies differ when it came to introducing new monsters to the Godzilla franchise. Starting with Son of Godzilla, because anytime you hear people talking about that movie in regards to the monsters, this is how it basically sums up. The way Kamakurus and Kumonga were depicted in the movie is really cool and refreshing, but at the end of the day, they're just giant insect-themed monsters. And as far as the titular Son of Godzilla himself, he's an annoyance. With the monster roster in Destroy All Monsters, that movie introduced a ton of new monsters to the Godzilla franchise. However, all those monsters appeared in other Godzilla movies or non-Godzilla movies beforehand. So, sure, they're new to the franchise, but they're not new monsters. With the two new monsters that appear in this movie, even though Megalon and Jet Jaguar have only appeared in this one movie, outside of the movie, they've become fan favorites to a point that multiple people want to see new interpretations of these two monsters. And, Unlike most of the new monsters that were introduced in something like Sonic Godzilla, people do indeed talk about these two monsters. With the Megalon, I already gave my two cents on him earlier, so I'm not going to talk about him anymore. With Jet Jaguar, on the other hand, he's a pretty cool addition to the overall monster roster within the Godzilla franchise since Jet Jaguar is the first robot-themed monster to appear within the Godzilla franchise, something that's never been done before. And his design aesthetic overall is really refreshing, where you have this one monster that's not based on like some pre-existing animal or mythological creature with Jet Jaguar on the other hand on top of being a giant robot he has the most unique design out of any Godzilla character seen within the franchise because he is by far the most humanoid looking character seen so far. Now sure you do have King Kong from King Kong vs. Godzilla who has a more human-like posture to him, but like I said earlier, King Kong's overall design aesthetic is based off a pre-existing animal, whereas the Jaguar's design isn't. Then you get the two returning monsters of Godzilla who needs no reintroduction, and Gigan, the titular antagonist of the previous movie, Godzilla vs. Gigan, since he was the main highlight of that movie, and on top of that, I'm pretty sure Toe decided to reuse him for the simple reason that, hey, you know what, we got this costume, why not we get as much out of it as much as possible, which worked well to this movie's advantage. Another aspect to the monsters that I liked has to do with the fact that the monsters themselves have a sense of personality, since a lot of people outside of the Godzilla fanbase often look at the monsters as being these big, dumb animals that just roar, destroy buildings, and have no sense of character. 
And that's something that's always bugged me because Godzilla, along with his other monster co-stars, aren't just animals. They too are characters that do have a distinct personality to them. It just so happens that the way Godzilla and his monster co-stars are depicted in this movie are depicted as less naturalistic characters and more as cartoon characters. Which works well to the movie's overall advantage since the movie itself is already campy in tone to begin with. So given the monsters more cartoonish personalities make sense in the grand scheme of things. I also like the relationship between certain monsters like Megalon and Gigan because if I had to describe the two together, they're basically the Godzilla equivalent of Bulk and Skull from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers TV show, just giant sized. And then on top of that, the pairing of Megalon and Gigan as a tag team is also the first time in the Godzilla franchise in which a monster from Earth joins forces with a monster from outer space. Something that doesn't happen very often. Or if it has happened since then, it might have only happened maybe one or two more times within the franchise as a whole. I also like how the conflict of the monsters continues the themes of anti-humanism. And before I go any further, if you're trying to remember what the term humanism means, it's a fancy way of saying mankind is the end-all, be-all thing in the entire universe that places itself at the top of the food chain, believing that we are better than anything that's natural, supernatural, or religion. Now, in terms of how this movie deals with the themes of anti-humanism, you have Jet Jaguar, who is a robot that's created by man. And at one point in the movie, he programs himself to grow giant side to take on Megalon before Godzilla arrives. And keep in mind, Megalon is a religious figure to the Cetopians. And as Jet Jaguar is battling Megalon, Jet Jaguar is actually doing really well against Megalon, thus providing a classic example of humanism at its finest. However, forces beyond his control soon arrive in the form of Gigan, who assists Megalon, thus the tables turn on Jet Jaguar. Sometime later, Godzilla shows up, who represents nature itself. And this leads into a giant tag team battle with Godzilla and Jet Jaguar battling both Megalon and Gigan. And by the time the battle comes to its conclusion with Godzilla and Jet Jaguar emerging victorious, it's not quite a victory for humanism, since humanism, that's represented by Jet Jaguar, had to align itself with one of the elements that it claims to be above. In this case, Godzilla, who represents nature, thus proving that humanity is not the end-all, be-all thing like most people make it out to be, since we had to rely on a greater power to guarantee the victory for humanity. And speaking of tag team battles, I think out of all the tag team matchups featured within the Godzilla franchise, well, at least the tag team battles that feature two-on-two -two monster action, this one is probably my favorite of the bunch since it has a diverse cast of monsters that aren't being controlled by any alien forces, they're just being themselves. There's a ton of memorable moments throughout the battle itself, and it's just a lot of fun to watch. Another aspect to this movie that I like actually has nothing to do with the movie itself, but the movie's American theatrical poster, because the poster itself is so bad that it's good for a couple reasons. Reason number one, both Godzilla and Megalon are battling each other at the top of the World Trade Center, something that never happens in the movie. Hell, Godzilla and Megalon don't even battle each other in the city. Their battle predominantly takes place in the countryside in Japan. Reason number two, even if both Godzilla and Megalon did battle at the top of the World Trade Center, I don't think the buildings themselves would last very long since the way the monsters would literally crush the buildings as the two of them are fighting each other. And reason number three, the way the monsters are depicted here are really weird where you look at Godzilla, it looks like a cartoon caricature of Godzilla that's seen around that time period, and he's also breathing fire as opposed to his blue atomic breath. And then you contrast this with Megalon, who's very movie accurate. Although it's kind of hard to tell where his arms are in relation to his body, and he does have one extra toe, since the Megalon that's featured on this poster has three toes, whereas the one that's featured in the movie only has two. And of course, the movie itself has tons of unintentional funny moments that range from character interactions to ridiculous car chases, monster interactions, and of course, the great and infamous Godzilla dropkick. And there's plenty more ridiculous moments throughout this whole movie that are worth seeing, other than the infamous dropkick that I mentioned earlier.
Another aspect of this movie that I would like to talk about revolves around the Godzilla costume that's used in this movie. Because between Destroy All Monsters and Godzilla vs. Gigan, the Godzilla costume that was used between those movies gradually got worse as time went on. Case in point, if you pay attention to the Godzilla costume that's used in Godzilla vs. Gigan, it's literally falling apart in some scenes. So, the filmmakers basically had to use what little budget they had for the movie in order to create a new Godzilla costume. And one week later, the filmmakers do succeed in creating a new Godzilla costume, despite the limited budget they had. And I have mixed feelings towards this new Godzilla costume that was created for this movie. Because on one hand, I do think that it's impressive that the filmmakers were able to make a fully functioning Godzilla costume with not only a limited budget, but also the fact that they were able to make a Godzilla costume within a week, since it typically takes like months to make a fully functioning Godzilla costume. And the fact that the Godzilla costume used in this movie does as it was intended to do is impressive. However, my biggest gripe with the costume has to do with the combination of of both the dorsal fins and the overall head design that are used for this Godzilla costume. Because with something like the dorsal fin design that's used for this Godzilla costume, the dorsal fins do look like the typical maple leaf shape that you would see on other Godzilla costumes, but they don't look quite finished to a point that it almost looks as if the dorsal fins made for this costume could fall off at any point in time. Then you have the overall head design to this Godzilla costume. Because from the side point of view, you can clearly tell that this is meant to be a more cartoonish take on the Godzilla character, and looks as such. But when you look at the costume from the front point of view, Godzilla's facial structure looks less like that of a dinosaur and more of a gorilla in this case. Which is really weird because Godzilla's supposed to be a dinosaur and not an ape. At least that's how I view the costume from the front point of view. Another aspect to the movie that I have mixed feelings towards takes the form of that of Megalon digging through the earth itself. Well, at least that one scene where we do see him digging from Seatopia going up to the surface. Because if you watch enough giant monster movies, especially within the context of the Godzilla franchise, there are multiple monsters that have the ability to borrow underground. And when you do see these monsters demonstrating this ability, you always see them digging into the earth or digging out of the earth. But you never ever see the monster digging beneath the earth itself. And this movie shows us a giant monster digging beneath the earth itself, which is a really cool visual to see. Well, at least conceptually speaking. Because when you do see Megalon digging towards the surface, I get what's going on visually. It's just one of those things where the way the filmmakers pulled off the effect is handled poorly. However, that being said, I do enjoy seeing this scene of Megalon digging towards the surface for more ironic reasons because even though the scene itself is only a few seconds long, I do think that seeing the visual of Megalon digging towards the surface is cute in a fugly kind of way, if that makes any sense. In terms of what I disliked about the movie, I'm going to start with the technicals first, then go into plot details later, but the first problem that I have with the movie is something that I have mentioned before in my reviews of Godzilla's Revenge and Godzilla vs. Gigan. That being, this movie relies too much on stock footage. And I get that around this time period, the budget to these movies wasn't ideal, and the studio had to rely heavily on stock footage to make these movies, which is understandable. But if you have seen some of my other reviews in which I bring up the problem of movies relying heavily on stock footage, then you already know the kind of problems I have with this movie using stock footage. So, moving on. Another problem that I have with the movie, there are several points in time where you either see monsters jumping or flying from one location to another, and you can clearly see the strings used to depict said monsters' movements, regardless if they're flying or jumping. Another problem that I have with the movie revolves around the human-centered fight scenes due to the combination of camera work and editing that's present during these action sequences. 
Now, what do I mean by this? If I had to describe the human fight scenes in this movie, they're very reminiscent to that of the type of fight scenes you would see in something like The Bourne Ultimatum, where there's tons of shaky camera movements, the way the camera angles are shot makes it really hard to tell where characters are in relationship to one another. The editing is very quick and sporadic to a point that it makes it very hard to tell what's going on during said fight scene. However, unlike the fight scenes that you would see in the Bourne Ultimatum, the fight choreography in this movie is poorly executed because it doesn't really look like the human characters are fighting each other. Instead, they look like they're just pushing one another. Another problem that I have with the movie revolves around the English dub, but not for the reasons that you think. The first example actually has to do with the opening narration because as the scene is set up, you have this map showing off the world and the narrator is giving information about how certain parts of the world are conducting underground ground nuclear tests and right before the opening title occurs the narrator's line just abruptly cuts off and you don't ever hear what the rest of the sense is although this only occurs at the very start of the movie so in the grand scheme of things having the narrator's last line of dialogue cutting off is really just a minor detail within the movie Another problem that I have with the English dub has to do with the audio quality because I do think that the English dub in regards to its audio quality is pretty good in that sense where it's consistent and you can hear every single line of dialogue that every character is saying. However, there are a few points in time where the audio quality is so drastically different that it sounds really bad. For example, there's this one point in time where you have the main cast of characters driving home from the lake and the audio quality is so bad that you can barely hear what the main characters are saying to one another and there's no consistency with the audio that's heard in this one sequence. I also think that the voice acting to the English dub sounds really bad because if you pay attention to the way the voice actors give their performances and deliver their lines of dialogue, the characters come off as very bored and bland as opposed to being interesting and lively, if that makes any sense. Now, as far as the actual problems I have with the movie in regards to its story, the movie doesn't really establish things clearly because when the movie starts, we're introduced to our our main cast of characters and when I first saw the movie I was under the presumption that between the three characters two of them were a father-son duo while the other character was either the kid's uncle or a family friend but as the movie progressed we find out that the characters that I presumed were the father-son duo are really brothers and the relationship to the third protagonist is still left unclear as to whether or not he's a family friend or a legit family member. And the lack of establishing information and relationships between certain characters doesn't just stop at the main cast of characters. It also extends to the main support cast as well. Most of them revolved around Jet Jaguar, starting with his origin. Because the only thing established about Jet Jaguar early on in the movie is the fact that the main character is building a robot. Which is cool, but for what purpose? Did the main character build Jet Jaguar to be used as a military weapon? Was he really bored and just made Jet Jaguar for fun? or was he trying to advance the field of robotics? Nothing is established about the reason as to why Jet Jaguar was made. Then you have the connection between Jet Jaguar and the Cetopian agents because I can understand as to why Cetopia needs to control Jet Jaguar for their own needs but I don't exactly understand as to how they knew about Jet Jaguar. Because near the beginning of the movie when we have the main cast of characters coming home from the lake, they discover that their house has been broken into and when they enter the house, the two Cetopian agents knock them out and leave. And my question is, how do they know about the inventor and his robot? And when did they know about it? And sometime later, the ruler of Cetopia realizes that Megalon needs help and decides to contact Space Nebula Hunter M, the primary antagonistic force behind Godzilla vs. Gigan, and by extension Gigan. And again, much like how his henchmen knew about Jet Jaguar, how does the ruler of Cetopia know about Space Nebula Hunter M and Gigan? Seriously, this movie is raising questions 
questions that don't get answered. Also, while on the subject of talking about the aliens from the previous Godzilla movie, there is an inconsistency with the naming convention for those aliens when it comes to this movie. Because in Godzilla vs. Gigan, they come from this dying planet or galaxy called Space Hunter Nebula M in both the Japanese sub and the English dub. Yet when it comes to this movie in the Japanese sub, they're still called Space Hunter Nebula M. Yet in the English dub for this movie, it's called Star Hunter Universe M for some reason. Reason? Because by calling the aliens in the English dub Star Hunter Universe M in the movie, this is both a mistranslation of the Japanese dialogue and an inconsistency within the continuity of the Godzilla movies as far as the English dub is concerned. Not sure why this is the case, but it is. And sorry for that little side tangent, but moving on to other plot points that didn't make any sense. Sometime between the first third and the second third of the movie, one of the main villains successfully captures two of our main heroes and puts them into a shipping container and tells these two random truck drivers to deliver this container to the now dried up lake. And as the scene progresses, one of the truck drivers decides to turn on the radio, and as soon as they do, they begin hearing news of a new monster going on a rampage and decide that maybe they shouldn't be doing the job today because of the new monster. However, unaware to them, the guy who set the job up in the first place is really one of the Seatopians and soon pulls a gun on them. And sometime later, the two truck drivers manage to force the guy out of the truck and that particular Seatopian agent falls off a cliff leading to his death. And it's at this moment where the movie doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Because a few moments ago, the truck drivers came to a logical conclusion that maybe they shouldn't do the job because of the giant monster, yet after they kill the bad guy, they continue the job anyways. Like, wouldn't it have made a lot more sense sometime after they killed the bad guy that maybe the truck drivers decide to stop the job altogether and see what's in the cargo hold? But no, they just continue the job that was given to them without question. And eventually they do encounter the monster, they retreat, and those two characters are never seen or mentioned again throughout the rest of the movie. And while on the subject of villain death scenes, I found that the way the two Cetopian agents that have been acting as the primary antagonistic force towards our main human cast to have very underwhelming death scenes. Because between the two Cetopian agents who meet their end, their death scenes are very underwhelming where you get the one Cetopian agent that I was talking about a few moments ago where he gets killed not by the main cast of characters but by two random minor characters by being pushed out of a moving truck and falling off a cliff. And as for the other Cetopian who acts as the primary human antagonist towards our main group of human characters, there's a great sub to his death, but it doesn't play out like you think it does. Because sometime before Jet Jaguar and Megalon battle each other, Megalon is still in the midst of his rampage, and he's heading towards the home of our main cast of characters. And at this point, our main human trio managed to knock out the Cetopian agent and leave him at their house. And what you would think would happen next is seeing Megalon stomp on the house, destroying both the house along with the Cetopian agent, but we don't get that. Instead, Megalon is somewhere in the countryside, kicking boulders, and during the scene, we cut to that Cetopian agent who is now conscious and in the middle of a grassy field getting crushed by one of these boulders. And the problem that I have with these two deaths is you got the one Cetopian agent who was killed by two minor characters as opposed to two main characters, and you got the other Cetopian agent who has a good setup for a character death but with no good payoff. And the other problem that I have with the movie is the fact that even though this movie is called Godzilla vs. Megalon, Godzilla really doesn't appear much in the movie because he first appears within the first five minutes of the movie, but he doesn't reappear again until the 48 minute mark. And even then when he does reappear, he doesn't feel like a main monster character. Instead, he feels more like the guest character in his own movie. Now granted, I get that this movie was originally supposed to be a movie about Jet Jaguar battling Megalon, and both Godzilla and Gagan were added later, I still find it really weird that Godzilla's presence in this movie feels more secondary than primary. And for my last 
problem that I have with the movie revolves around J Jaguar, but not for the reasons that you think. Because the common problems that people have with Jet Jaguar come down to one of two things. The first problem being that Jet Jaguar is a robot that's ran by artificial intelligence that gains a free will of his own. And sure, Jet Jaguar getting a free will of his own does come out of nowhere, but I can see why this occurred, where maybe he's still trying to continue the mission that his master gave him and he wants to see the mission through. So maybe that's why Jet Jaguar gained free will in the first place. Then of course you got the infamous Jet Jaguar programming himself to grow giant size in order to battle Megalod, which, much like the free will, comes straight out of nowhere to a point where Jet Jaguar growing giant size is kind of considered to be a deus ex machina within the movie, and as ridiculous as Jet Jaguar growing giant size is, I'm willing to let this aspect of the character slide only because he's battling a giant bipedal rhinoceros beetle with drills for hands. And now I bet you're wondering, wait, if you didn't have a problem with Jet Jaguar having free will of his own or growing giant size, what problem do you have with Jet Jaguar? The one problem that I have with Jet Jaguar occurs when he's battling Megalon, since there's this one point in time where Megalon is flying circles around him, and Jet Jaguar is essentially watching Megalon fly circles around him, and as he's doing so, Jet Jaguar gets dizzy. Do you see the problem? Jet Jaguar is a giant robot that got dizzy. And this is the problem I have with the character. Why does Jet Jaguar get dizzy? It'd be one thing if he was depicted in the same vein as something like Ultraman or Zone Fighter where the superhero character itself is organic in nature. Then I could see that character getting dizzy. But Jet Jaguar is a robot. He shouldn't get dizzy. If anything, I feel like Jet Jaguar watching Megalon spin in circles should not affect him. If anything, you should be watching Megalon make a calculation in terms of when he's going to strike next and then attack Megalon before he has that chance. Instead, what we get is Megalon flying circles around him only for Jet Jaguar to stumble and fall on the ground, allowing Megalon to attack. Jet Jaguar gained free will of his own and growing giant size, I can deal with. But Jet Jaguar gained dizzy, that's where I draw the line. So, for my final verdict of Godzilla vs. Megalon, the movie in a nutshell is nothing more than a shameless retread of Godzilla vs. Gigan. In that sense where both movies have similar plot structures with similar key elements and even have similar technical issues because of budgetary reasons. That being said, I do think that Godzilla vs. Megalon is more enjoyable to watch than something like Godzilla vs. Gigan. And I know that sounds really weird considering the fact that these two movies are very similar in nature, but here's why I enjoy Godzilla vs. Megalon more than something like Godzilla vs. Gigan. With something like Godzilla vs. Gigan, that movie takes itself way too seriously to a point where the movie is not really all that fun to watch. And the overall story is very bland in the grand scheme of things because it's something we've seen before and done better in other Godzilla movies. With something like Godzilla vs. Megalon, it's the exact opposite where the movie doesn't take itself seriously to a point where it's loads of fun to watch, albeit for ironic reasons, but fun to watch regardless. And to on top of that, the movie itself takes a lot of plot devices that we've seen before, but goes in a slightly different direction with them to make itself different from the average Godzilla movie that features a story like this. Now, would I recommend this movie? Well, I put this movie in the same category as something like Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster and Godzilla vs. Hedorah War. On one hand, I don't think you necessarily need to watch this movie, but on the other hand, if you do end up watching Godzilla vs. Megalon, do it in the same vein as something like Mystery Science Theater 3000 where you get a group of friends together and just riff on it. So, overall, Godzilla vs. Megalon is a movie that falls into the category of being a classic example of a movie being so bad that it's really good. And before I give my final rating, what did everyone else have to say about Godzilla vs. Megalon? So it looks like Godzilla vs. Megalon got generally negative reception. And so, for my final rating of Godzilla vs. Megalon, I give it a 3 out of 5. So, do you think this movie would have been a better Jet Jaguar movie if Tao didn't add Godzilla and Gigan? Or do you think the movie is a lot better because it added both Godzilla and Gigan? And see you later.